Okay, this is a PDF of the article that you should have received in class on the first Monday that we uh, met. What I'd like to do is actually take you through the activity that we either did or would have done in class and um, give you a sense as to how to start looking at these and evaluating these. If you don't have a copy of the article, the PDF is available to you in Blackboard. And um, so what I'd like you to do first is I want you to take eight minutes and time yourself with this. So pause the video right now and take eight minutes to read through this article. You'll note that including references, it's uh, 23 pages in the PDF. Um, but if you're noticing that each of the PDF or printed version pages are actually two pages in the journal. So that means that the article is about 45 or so pages, including its references. So what I'd like you to do, as I said, pause the video now and then read through the article or take eight minutes to read through the article. So stop wherever you happen to be at the eight minute mark. Okay, welcome back. Now, the first thing I would ask you, and if we were meeting in class, I would ask all of you, is how far you got in the article. And we would actually go for a specific number of pages. Now, if you started at the beginning, so if you started up here in the abstract area, and you started to read through in a linear fashion, my guess is that you probably only made it to somewhere around these tables here, maybe a little bit before, a little bit after. Um, you know, so you're looking at somewhere between 608 to maybe 618, 619, which as you can see from the slider here on the side, or if you were just to count up the pages, that takes you roughly halfway through the article. Now, keep in mind the fact that You've got a lot of reading to do over the next six to eight weeks as you prepare for your ability to write your literature review. You don't have the ability to spend hours upon hours or even you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes per article to determine whether or not an article is going to be useful to you for your literature review. Now, for the ones that you determine are useful, so the actual 25 or 30 or 35 that you're going to be using in your literature review, those are ones you're going to want to read more carefully. But the ones that you're just looking through now as you're scanning to determine is an article relevant, and as you're looking through, say, for example, to do the annotated bibliography that's coming up in a few weeks' time, there are a couple of skills that you want to use, or a couple of shortcuts, if you will, that you want to use. The first shortcut is pay attention to the abstract. The abstract, in most cases, will give you what the author thinks are the main things that are in the article. Now, there are certain unwritten rules about an abstract, for example, what you tend to find is that most abstracts will try to situate the research problem in a larger context. So this may be in terms of talking about the, the literature or talking about the field in general. They will generally give you a sentence, maybe two, that talks a little bit about the methodology that was used. And then they'll usually go in and talk about the findings. In most abstracts, that's probably where the bulk of the content will be. Now, you'll note most abstracts are only five to eight sentences long. So when I say the bulk of the content, I really just mean two, maybe four sentences. Then sometimes you may have sort of a, a summary kind of idea um, or the main takeaway or the author's attempts to, you know, what's moving forward kind of thing. So if you're looking at this particular abstract, and, and we'll read through it here now carefully, and let me increase the size on this so we can actually take a closer look at it here. 
so this particular abstract begins the article this article provides an extensive overview of the recent literature on student evaluations of teaching or sets in higher education so that gives you sort of you know the the broad purpose of it the review is based on the set and meta validation model drawing upon research reports published in peer reviewed journals since 2000 so that's a statement about the methodology through the lens of validity, we consider both more traditional research themes in the field of SET, i.e. the dimensional debate, the bias question, and the design, uh, the questionnaire design, and some recent trends in SET research, such as online SET and biased investigations into additional teacher or personal characteristics. Another sentence about the methodology. So, so far we've got, you know, one broad sentence that sort of situates the article within the larger field. You know, it's a review of recent literature in the student evaluation of teaching. When it comes to the methodology, they're using what they call a meta-validation model. Their data are peer-reviewed uh, research reports from journals since 2000. Um, they are specifically looking at issues such as dimensionality, bias, questionnaire design, as well as online sets, bias investigations into teacher characteristics. You know, so these are some of the variables that they're looking at. Moving on. The review provides a clear idea of the state of the art with regard to research on set thus allowing researchers to formulate suggestions for future research. So, in all honesty, I would expect that kind of sentence at the end, because that's sort of a summary sentence. You know, this is the main takeaway. This is really what the article is going to allow them to do. Um, it is argued that SET remains a current yet delicate topic in higher education, as well as in educational research. Many stakeholders are not convinced of the usefulness and validity of SET for both formative and summative purposes. Research on SET has thus failed to provide clear answers to several critical questions concerning the validity of SET. So those last three sentences, that's essentially touching on or foreshadowing the findings that you will see later on in the article. So the first thing I would do if I were reviewing this as a potential item for inclusion in my own literature review would be I would actually take a look and, and spend some time on that abstract. You know, if I'm looking at a six to eight minute window on each of these articles, what I would likely do is probably spend, you know, almost upwards of a minute to a minute and a half looking at that um, particular abstract, because that's really going to give me, if it's a well-written abstract, is going to give me a, a good sense of what the article is about. Now, in all honesty, the next thing that I would do if I were reading this article is I would skip all of this stuff and I would go down to page 629. And what I'm looking for here specifically is this conclusion area over here. You know, the conclusion or the conclusions and implications or summary, or those are the three titles you'll often see for that final section. That's essentially the author's last chance to tell you, you know, this is what we found and this is why it's important. So let's take a look at that specific area right now. So I'm going to increase the size again here now so we can take a look at the conclusions here. So now what you will find in most conclusions is a well-written conclusion will actually do three things. The first thing is that it will essentially summarize the article and in particular if it's a research study the main findings of that particular study. The second thing that it should do is it should provide implications for practice and by that I mean we've just spent all this time doing this research study based on what we've learned this is what practitioners in this area should consider or should do or should think about when they are doing whatever it is we just studied the third thing that a good conclusion uh, section will do is it will offer advice or suggestions for future research you know again we've spent all this time researching this particular study we spent all of this time researching this particular study. Based upon that research, this is what we think the next set of studies or the next study should be about.
You know, so if you've got a well-written conclusion, they'll do those things. Not all conclusions are well-written. You know, so if we look at this one, for example, this review of the state of the art in the literature has shown that the utility and validity ascribed to set should continue to be called into question. Next to some, although much researched topics such as dimensionality debate and the bias question, new research lines are delineated. That is, the utility of online set, teacher personal characteristics affecting set, our systematic use of the meta validity framework of Anwu Buzi et al. or and colleagues, 2009, however, shows that many types of validity of set remain at stake. Because conclusive evidence has not been found yet, such evaluation should be considered fragile as important stakeholders, that is, the subjects of evaluations and their educational performance, are often judged according to the indicators of effective teaching, in some cases as a singular or single indicator, the value of which continues to be contested in the research literature. So if I'm looking at this particular conclusion, these first few sentences where it starts off the review of the state of the art in the literature, right up until the validity of uh, sorry, many types of validity of set remain at stake. So those first three sentences, that really summarizes the article and summarizes the author's findings. You know, this is essentially what they found. So what they're telling you, without having read the rest of the article, is they used this meta-validity um, technique, which they told us back in the abstract they were going to use. And based upon that, they found that there's a number of questions that still remain when it comes to the set based upon the data that they have. Um, you know, while there seems to be a couple of topics, the dimensional debate and the bias question, that have a lot of research done on them, things like whether or not the online version of student evaluations of teaching or whether teachers, the teacher's own personal characteristics affect their student evaluation of teaching. Those things, while they have some research, they don't have a lot of research. And in all of those four areas that they specifically mention, when you look at whether or not the student evaluation of teaching is a valid measure, well, based on their results, that's they're not really finding that at this stage. You know, so that's what these first three sentences are saying. If you look at that last sentence, the one that begins, because conclusive evidence. Now, it's a kind of long sentence. They could have cut it up a little bit. But essentially, that is their implications for practice. You know, basically, what they're saying there is because we found that, you know, student evaluations of teaching may not be the best measure of whether or not someone's a good teacher, um, at least based on the research. There's still a lot of questions about this. Maybe the folks that use these things, for example, the students that fill them out, the teachers that review them as a way of, you know, changing their practices or, um, you know, adjusting their course design, or for that matter, their administrators that use them to evaluate those teachers, you know, maybe all of those people should think twice about whether or not this is really a useful way to determine whether or not someone's a good teacher. And, you know, as they, they don't come quite out and say it, but, um, you know, this idea of are often judged according to indicators of effective teaching, in some cases a single indicator. What they're suggesting there is that, you know, in many cases, the student evaluation of teaching is the only thing we use to determine if someone's a good teacher in higher education. And they're suggesting maybe we should think twice about that. Now, you'll note the one thing that they don't do is they don't provide any um, suggestions for future research, but that's okay for our purposes because, you know, essentially we've gone now and, you know, the actual text of the article is 31 pages if you exclude all of the references. And really in a couple, three minutes, because you will probably spend another minute or so on the conclusion, depending on how long it is. This one probably about a minute. Other conclusions may be a little bit longer because um, oftentimes there'll be two or three paragraphs. 
And, you know, but in that two or three minutes that we've spent, both just with the abstract and with the conclusion, we now have a pretty good sense of what this article is not only about, but what this actual study found. Now, in all honesty, for you guys, as you're reviewing the, um, you know, dozens or hundreds of results that you get, as you are searching the literature in these first few weeks, one of the things I would recommend is if you've read the abstract and you've read the conclusion and you can determine right now that this article isn't that useful to you or isn't useful to you at all, I would stop reading at this point. Um, you know, because really it's a waste of your time to go any further. Now, if as you're going through in that abstract or in that conclusions there was something that you read that was of interest to you chances are that it was well not chances are I can almost guarantee that it was primarily focused upon the results so if I did come across something that was of interest to me um, as I read through there and being you know a faculty member in higher education this is obviously a topic that is kind of of interest to me whether or not the student evaluations of teaching that you do at the end of every semester um, are really a valid measure of how good a teacher I am and whether or not I should be adjusting the way that I teach and also adjusting the nature of the course content based upon the suggestions you have you know so in that respect you know for my own purposes this would be an article that hey yeah this has some interest to me so what I would actually do then is I would go back to the results so they begin on page 602 here and I wouldn't read through these what I would do is I would start skimming through these um, you know, because there was something that I read in the abstract or something that I read in the conclusion that got me interested in this particular study. So now I'm going to skim through pages 602 and 603 here, and then I'll skim through 604 and 605. Um, 606 and most of 607 is a table, so I likely probably would skip over that. I'd skim through 607. I'd skim through 608 and 609. As you can see, 610 and 611, as well as 612 and 613, 614 and 615, and 616 are all a table. So I'd skip all of that. I'd continue to skim through here on 617, as well as 618 and 619. And by skim, I mean I'm looking for specific words or phrases. Essentially, the words or phrases that I came across in the conclusion that attracted me to finding out more about this particular article. Um, so I'm, again, just skimming through, looking for those words, you know, in 620 and 621, as well as 622 and 623, and then 624 and 625, and then I hit 626, and that's really where the results section ends. So you see here on the bottom of 626, there's a discussion section. And that's where the results have stopped. So once they hit the discussion section, what they're essentially doing then is they're discussing what they found in light of what was already known. Essentially, how did the results section jive with the literature review? So, you know, I've got probably about 10 pages or so there that I'm going to be skimming. Um, but mainly, like I say, skimming, looking for specific words or phrases that got me interested in this topic. Unless this study was exactly what I wanted to do. Like if I read the particular study and said, hey, I would, you know, this is what I'd like to do my thesis on. I'd like to replicate this study in my particular context or in my particular um, classroom or my school or my district or what have you. That's really pretty much all I would read in this particular article for the purposes of writing a literature review. Now, one of the pieces of advice I always give folks is as they're reading through this, particularly for as they're writing their literature reviews, um, depending upon how close or how far away the topic is from what you're interested in, looking at the literature review itself oftentimes isn't a bad thing just to see the citations that they're using. You know, so if I was interested in um, specifically, not necessarily just student evaluations of teaching in general, um, but, um, you know, how, um, just looking at one of the paragraphs here to give you an example. 
um, you know, the issue of the administration of student evaluations of teaching, which is this paragraph right here that begins third. Um, so if I were specifically interested in, um, you know, the administration of student evaluations of teaching, if that was the area of my research, then I might start looking through this particular one to see who they're citing. You know, through they're citing Johnson, they're citing Franklin, they're citing Ori, another Franklin and Tail. Um, actually, it was cited in Paulson, so that's a secondary citation. Um, you know, and I would go to the reference list to find these particular ones and to see if I could get them through our database or see if I could request them through interlibrary loan. Um, you know, so for your purposes as you're scanning through, that's really how I would go about it. So I would read the abstract carefully. I would read the conclusion carefully. If there was something in the conclusion that interested me, I would start skimming or scanning through the results looking for that um, particular item or those particular items, I should say, so I could, you know, read a little, once I came across them, obviously, I'd want to read a, them a little bit closely, because, you know, that was what interested me to go looking in that area. If there was nothing in the conclusion and abstract that really caught my attention, um, if that was enough for me to determine that this is an article that, you know, isn't useful for my literature review, then I would, um, you know, stop and move on to the next one. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit when it came to this particular article uh, is I wanted to highlight or illustrate how it's an example of a literature review or how they use the literature in their literature review. There are two ways in which you can review the literature. The first is what we would call a funneling or a narrowing effect, and then the other is a more thematic or topical approach. So what you have here, and the literature review in this particular article begins on the second page, so it begins on 599 here, up here with the section that begins purpose of set. And the literature review continues essentially for about two and a half pages. So it continues along page 600, and then it stops here at the top of 601 when you see the section that begins a cur the current study. So the current study is the next section. It's the first section and really the methodology portion. So they've got about two and a bit pages of literature review. And when you look at the nature of this literature review, and as you read through it, because most of you probably started reading in a linear fashion, you got through these first three or four pages, so you know what the literature review says, or at least you have a sense as to how it was structured. This is a good example of one of those that have you know, a funneling or a narrowing effect. So you'll see up here in these first two paragraphs, in the purpose of set. Essentially what they're doing is they're talking about the student evaluation of teaching in a very broad way. So they're essentially giving you the overview of you know what the set is and why we use it. Then in on the bottom of page 599 uh, here they transition to okay you know this is how it's used but here are some of the concerns that teachers have about the reliability and validity of the way in which the student evaluation of teaching is used and you can see he, the authors or author actually authors sorry um, spend three paragraphs talking about the teacher concerns about how the student evaluations of teaching are used then the authors conclude with two paragraphs that look specifically at research related to those concerns that teachers have about how the student evaluations of teaching are used. So you notice how each section as they go through the focus on the topic becomes m more and more narrow or more and more focused and that's one way in which you can uh, do a literature review. Now, when you're looking at for the purposes of a thesis or dissertation, this tends to be the minority in ways in which it's done. The thematic or topical way tends to be the more common way. And for most of you in the class, it'll likely be that case. But for, you know, anywhere from a quarter to a third of you, you will find that the nature of your topic and the way in which the field around your topic develops, it will allow or facilitate that kind of narrowing process. So, 
this is the sort of first introduction that you have to reading these articles. Um, I'm, we're going to do another one here now in a second, and once we get that one done, um, hopefully that will help you over the next few weeks as you start to put together the data, essentially, or the evidence that you're going to use for your literature review uh, that you'll begin writing about halfway through the course.